a minute to okay uh if if you're ready shall we get started yeah sure okay uh welcome everyone to our october episode of the genome the gis speaker series i very thrilled to have as our speaker today professor moz hanifa who's a senior clinical research fellow at welcome professor of dermatology and immunology at newcastle university and uh, sanger institute uh, and uh, so i most actually trained briefly in singapore so, and we we proud to we proud to call you one of our own uh, you know, at, at least in part uh, uh, in asr actually and uh, she graduated from medical school in cardiff and came as a junior doctor in cambridge got her dermatology specialization in newcastle she was fellow of the academy of medical sciences 2020 brought the academy of medical sciences uh, hooks foundation medal in 2019 european federation of immunological societies prize in immunology and allergology 2018 uh and uh, one of the really shining stars of the human cell atlas uh, initiative and she's pioneered single cell uh, analysis for human for the human immune system human skin health and disease and uh, you know she's uh, really passionate about mentoring and diversity in science which is a big aspect of the human cell atlas uh most looking forward to your talk Thank you very much um uh for the kind introduction and also for hosting me today. I have a very um you know affectionate spot I suppose for Singapore uh given that I'm actually from Malaysia and spent some time in Singapore uh during my postdoctoral years. Uh so what I'm going to do is actually talk a little bit about the work that we've been doing uh to understand the developing human immune system. and as sham had already introduced um most of this work is within the context of the human cell atlas so this is one of the the, the study of human development is one of the uh areas uh, of um, interest or focus within the human cell atlas initiative and we have a developmental biological network and in fact quite recently we wrote a perspective together with all of the members of the developmental biological network and other co-authors who are contributing to the developmental cell atlas on a road map of how we think uh, we can actually deliver uh, the developmental cell atlas and that was published a few weeks ago as a perspective article what i'm going to do with regards to science is focus on much of the work that we've been doing in studying how the human immune system develops and this is quite a complex process because it occurs across multiple anatomical sites and also across gestation time and i'll take you through a little bit uh, in terms of the steps but also that it therefore involves several disciplines uh hematopoiesis being involved or, or being focused on how the you know differentiation occurs immunology the kind of uh, functional uh, aspects or attributes of the immune cells and also developmental biology within the context of how organ uh, morphogenesis is ongoing at that point so the first site of hematopoiesis is actually in an extra embryonic tissue called the yolk sac where progenitors give rise to blood and immune cells and this really happens very early on at about 2 to 2 post concept 2 to 3 post conception weeks and then uh you have the aotogonad mesonephros a structure which is intraembryonic which gives rise to definitive hematopoietic stem cells which then seed several tissues including the liver which becomes the dominant site of hematopoiesis from about 5 post conception weeks onwards all the way to 20 post conception weeks before it subsequently declines as an organ for hematopoiesis the bone marrow develops around 11 post conception weeks and starts to become an organ uh, that generates blood and immune cells from there uh, but really only becomes the dominant site after 20 post conception weeks and remains so as the main place where blood and immune cells are made in our postnatal life then you have two other additional organs the first the thymus uh, 
whereby lymphoid progenitors from the liver and bone marrow seed uh, this tissue and the cells undergo um, differentiation into T cells of various uh, types. And then you have the spleen where B cells that are primarily made in the bone marrow seed the spleen and further undergo maturation and differentiation, primarily somatic hypermutation and the formation of germinal centers, which really occurs after birth. Then you have all of these blood and immune cells and some of the progenitors in early life seeding the peripheral organs, the non-lymphoid tissues such as the skin, kidney and gut, where they adapt and form the immune surveillance network of that tissue. So you can see here this complex process that has to be coordinated across uh, space and time. And the way that you can study this in human, because you can't really label a cell and watch the cell uh, in, in vivo in, in the human setting, uh, what you can do is essentially take snapshots uh, of multiple organs that are involved in the various aspects of uh, formation of the blood and immune cells uh, and across time. Uh, and you can then put together this information to sort of uh, understand the kinetics and the temporal um, evolution of this development. And we're very lucky in the UK to have the Human Developmental Biology Resource uh, which is funded by Wellcome and MRC that provides us with embryonic and fetal uh, tissue resource to undertake this work. Uh, and they're based in um, Newcastle and also London. So the way that we propose is using this kind of high, uh, high throughput, uh, large scale uh, single cell genomics or omics technologies will be the ability to then construct the picture of how the immune system develops to understand how the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So moving away from looking at specific lineages or cell types and begin to see the emergent properties of the immune system. And what I'm going to do is to summarize um, three manuscripts. Uh, one, the first is uh, work that we published um, two years ago now, uh, which includes data primarily from the liver and it was focused on understanding liver hematopoiesis but also had data from the skin and kidney to put into context what happens in the non-lymphoid tissues and also in the yolk sac, which would also contribute to some cells in some of these organs. And then a work that we published very recently, in fact, two weeks ago uh, um, on bone marrow hematopoiesis uh, and also uh, work on the T cell differentiation. And the way that I want to do this is to sort of begin to um, stitch together this information so that we can understand the framework of how uh, this uh, undergo undertake uh, it happens in, in, in vivo. Um, as I mentioned, the interdisciplinary nature of the work really requires many, many researchers. And what I'm going to present is the collective effort of many groups. Uh, and I've listed all of the individuals' names uh, and um, you know, in, in, throughout the talk. Um, and yeah, cutting across all of the uh, disciplines that are involved. So very briefly in terms of what we studied from which organs. Uh, for the liver, we studied uh, samples from seven post-conception weeks all the way to 17 post-conception weeks, skin and kidney from the first trimester up to 12 post-conception weeks, because we didn't want to kind of have to account for the contribution of bone marrow hematopoiesis at this stage but we knew that yolk sac preceded liver hematopoiesis. So we looked at a few samples from the yolk sac. And for the bone marrow, we looked at samples from 11 to 19 post-conception weeks. And from the timers really from seven to 17 post-conception weeks, uh, which is when the timers developed. And for the main organs, the liver, bone marrow and timers, we analyzed more than 100,000 cells. We primarily used single cell RNA sequencing, but in the later stages of the work, we also incorporated um, TCR and BCR sequencing, and also more recently combined uh, surface protein and single cell RNA sequencing in the form of the uh, SiteSeq platform. So the take home message is that blood and immune cells in human develop by 20 post conception weeks. And the striking difference between liver and bone marrow is in the fetal liver, you see the main lineages, the lymphoid, myeloid, and erythroid lineages, but you do not see any neutrophils. Uh, and, um, you know, this really is something that uh, very much happens uh, in fetal bone marrow hematopoiesis, where you can see the eosinophil basophils and also uh, the neutrophil lineage emerging. So although 
neutrophil is the most abundant white cell in postnatal life, it really only emerges um, after 11 post-conception weeks of life. And the other notable thing is the massive expansion of the B lineage compartment uh, within the fetal bone marrow, whereas in the liver, it is very much uh, rudimentary. And I mentioned earlier this um, ability to then measure multi-omics uh, in single cells uh, has really allowed us to kind of um, be able to distinguish the transcriptionally defined cell states. And this is an example of fetal bone marrow and then combine it with the surface protein measurements. And I've just illustrated the ability to now distinguish early megakaryocyte and megakaryocytes. I mean, this is very much a supervised analysis. And in the manuscript, we present how we take the 188 surface proteins and you can actually do an analysis, some like decision tree uh, analysis, which allows you to then see what combination of the surface proteins can be best used to identify the cell states that had been identified, um, that had been annotated based on their transcriptome profile. Also um, being able to have the data from the yolk sac, liver, fetal bone marrow, and also repository data in the human cell atlas data portal for cord blood and adult bone marrow, one can begin to uh, look at hematopoiesis across organs and also lifespan. And we hope to supplement this data with pediatric data, which would really give us that uh, the full picture. So what can we learn by this type of analysis? And I'm going to illustrate here uh, using the myeloid lineage. Uh, and if you were to compare it across yolk sac, fetal liver, fetal bone marrow, and adult bone marrow. I mentioned earlier on the emergence of the metamyelocyte, myelocyte, and the neutrophil uh, granulocyte lineage essentially in the fetal bone marrow, which you can see um, happening, oops, sorry, happening here. Um, but you also have diversification of the dendritic cell subsets, the transitional dendritic cells expressing axel siglex 6 and also DC3 uh, really emerging in the fetal bone marrow. We also see um, only in the adult bone marrow CD16 monocyte and uh, monocyte uh, DCs which you don't really see in the fetal bone marrow. So you can begin to construct at what point the different populations and the diversification occurs. So what accounts for why we see granulocytes in the fetal bone marrow? And can we be sure that these are indeed granulocytes uh, simply based on their transcriptome profile? So what we did was leveraging the surface markers. We fact sorted, performed smart seq 2 analysis and also morphological analysis of the cells that we'd identified and isolated based on their surface marker expression. And you can see here, this is the projection of the cells that we isolated for various populations, including the uh, granulocyte lineage here, uh, which correspond very well with the discovery data set we generated using the 10X genomics platform. And if you then uh, did cytospin preparation and games of staining, you can see the classic appearance of the uh, polymorphic nuclei of the metamyelocytes, myelocytes, and neutrophils uh, confirming their identity, as well as the appearance of the basophils and eosinophils. So what about the reason or perhaps the characteristics of the progenitors that allows them to differentiate into neutrophils in the fetal bone marrow compared to uh, uh, fetal liver? And one of the uh, observations we found uh, was uh, relating to the GMP fraction in the fetal bone marrow, where if you interrogated these cells uh, based on whether they were enriched for monocyte signature or neutrophil signature, you can see that some of the GMPs are already expressing neutrophil signatures and some of the GMP are already expressing a monocyte signature. Uh, and so there's already diversification into the granulocyte lineage early on. And if you look at the fetal liver here, and the fetal bone marrow, you will see that the expression of the transcription factors that drive neutrophil differentiation, particularly CVPA uh, compared to SP1, uh, is very much uh, increased in the fetal bone marrow. And this is one of the reasons um, that you see um, granulocytes, and this may be due to the intrinsic properties of the progenitors in the fetal bone marrow that are being, uh, are uh, being driven down the granulocyte differentiation. Now I'm going to touch briefly on the B lymph uh, lymphoid lineage in the fetal bone marrow. If you do the analysis uh, comparing yolk sac, fetal liver, fetal bone marrow, adult bone marrow, you find that the proportion of B lineage cells of the hematopoietic cells is very similar in fetal bone marrow and adult bone marrow. However, 
the actual composition of the cell states are very different in that the fetal bone marrow has a higher representation of progenitor cells uh, all the way up to pre-B cells. And you have very few, in fact, immature and naive B cells. Whereas in the adult bone marrow, the progenitors are much lower uh, in terms of proportion compared to all B lineage cells. And there are many more naive B cells and you also see transitional memory and plasma cells. And one of the interesting observations, if you look at childhood leukemia is the propensity for B lymphoid leukemia to occur during childhood. And this may be due to the uh, proportional representation of B progenitors enabling or allowing a situation that um, for these for mutations to occur uh, and leukemic transformation to occur. <clears throat> so if you look at the B lineage differentiation uh, and uh, a company by transcriptome and accompanied by single cell uh, B cell receptor and uh, sequencing analysis, you will see that uh, as these cells differentiate into naive B cells, there is sequential acquisition of first heavy chain and then followed by light chain. And so there are more cells with heavy and light chain at a later stage of differentiation. And this acquisition is also accompanied by cell cycling. And what I haven't shown here is uh, apoptosis. So there's a, that this is, accompanies the sort of BCR selection that occurs in the uh, fetal bone marrow so that if you're not selected, the cells subsequently undergo apoptosis. So these are the kind of cycling phases that accompany the uh, linear differentiation into naive uh, B cells that you see in the fetal bone marrow. What about the lymphoid cells? Um, I'm going to now try and link it with the uh, analysis that we did in the fetal thymus. So if we took fetal liver and fetal thymus, just the progenitors, and here is the lymphoid progenitor and the thymus and the double negative T cells, what you find are these cells that we independently annotated as lymphoid progenitor occupy a similar projection space uh, in, in the uh, UMAP visualization here. Uh, they're also very similar transcriptionally. Uh, and before the onset of fetal bone marrow, this, like, this, this proposes to us that there are lymphoid progenitors that can actually seed the thymus uh, and likely undergo um, differentiation into double negative T cells. So when you do the same analysis with the fetal bone marrow, uh, you, you see the same picture. So thereafter, the you know, progenitors from the bone marrow can also enter the thymus and differentiate into T cells. If you then look at the thymocytes in the th developing thymus, you will see the sequential uh, acquisition or, or change from double negative to double positive, and then the formation of various uh, single positive uh, T cell types, which are both CD8 and CD4, expressing alpha beta, uh, TCRs, but also um, you know, NK T cells, CD8 alpha alpha, uh, two different types of those, uh, and also Treg and, and a more innate TH17 type cells. And you see some gamma delta cells there as well. And, and this data enables you to sort of begin to construct the transcription factors that may be involved uh, uh, along this differenti differentiation pathway uh, as predicted transcription factors, which you can then validate uh, and hopefully informing how one can actually uh, undertake tissue engineering to generate uh, you know, uh, T cells that are close to the, uh, their in vivo counterpart. And then what happens in the fetal bone marrow? So what you see are only CD4, CD8, and Tregs in the fetal bone marrow with regards to sort of um, T, T cells and um, the differentiated um, alpha beta T cells. You don't really see the early thymic progenitor or the um, double negative um, uh, cells in the, in the fetal bone marrow. So this explains, so the main thing is the fact that you don't see double negative, double positive cells. So basically this shows you that T cells differentiate in the thymus and then subsequently re-enter the fetal bone marrow um, uh, to to, to, to sort of like uh, reside there uh, and expressing all of the kind of like uh, markers of uh, naive T cells. I'm now going to describe two of the um, insights that we glean from uh, undertaking this work relating to hematopoietic stem cells uh, and their niche uh, across the uh, organs of hematopoiesis and across gestation time. So the first relates to the intrinsic properties of hematopoietic stem cells and their progenitors. Uh, 
So we did this by looking at the transcriptome profile, some of the surface marker expression, but also functional assay whereby we facts isolated single cells that fall into these various categories of hematopoietic stem cell and their progenitors, uh, and then cultured these single cells into colonies and subsequently analyzed them by flow cytometry to see what type of progenitors the individual hematopoietic stem cells made. And if you look at the initial molecular profile of the hematopoietic stem cells and progenitors, these are the types of progenitors and the differentiation lineage that they undergo. And if you look at the fetal liver, there is an abundance of progenitors uh, undergoing the erythroid lineage. And this is what you see in the fetal liver, a lot of erythroid cells. The fetal liver hematopoiesis is essentially a red blood cell making machine. Uh, whereas if you look at the fetal bone marrow, there is a relative contraction of the erythroid lineage, but there's greater expansion of cells undergoing the uh, lymphoid lineage as well as the uh, myeloid lineage. So this shows you that the composition of the progenitors and their molecular profile is different uh, across the uh, hematopoietic organs in prenatal life. And if you then took those single hematopoietic stem cells and cultured them just from the fetal liver and compared the cells from six to nine post-conception weeks liver compared to 15 to 18 post-conception weeks liver, you'll see that the ability to differentiate down the erythroid lineage declines but the ability to differentiate down the B lineage and the myeloid lineage increases. So there's something that changes for the hematopoietic stem cells within one hematopoietic organ very quickly across several weeks that allows it to differentiate into different cells. If you now took paired fetal liver and bone marrow hematopoietic stem cells, you see something quite different as well. Firstly, the proliferative capacity of fetal liver HSC far exceeds that of fetal bone marrow HSCs, and also the, the types of colonies that are formed. The bone marrow HSC MPPs are more likely to differentiate down a myeloid-only lineage, so a somewhat more restricted picture of the types of colonies that they form. So essentially, this tells us that the intrinsic properties of HSC changes in one organ, across gestation time and also changes across organs for the same gestation time. What about the extrinsic uh, hematopoietic tissue environment? Our data set is the first to uh, analyze using uh, SiteSeq the uh, bone marrow stroma uh, in human. Uh, and this is the data from the fetal bone marrow and you can see all of the different uh, cell states there. We correlated the um, stromal cells with uh, that found in the mouse uh, postnatal bone, bone marrow and showed good alignment uh, across species for the different cell types. Uh, what we were struck by were the appearance of two types of endothelial cells uh, in our transcriptome and also surface protein data. We annotated those cells as sinusoidal endothelial cells uh, because they express all the classic markers that had been described for sinusoidal endothelial cells and also tip endothelial cells, which you can see here. And these are the sort of like uh, endothelial cells at the tip of um, blood vessels that are growing. And the, the main um, differentially expressed um, RNA and protein was uh, CD34 and also VEGFR2, which is the gene being KDR. And when we looked by microscopy, this is the fetal bone marrow cross-section, what we found was there was greater abundance of these CD34 positive, um, high expressing uh, tip endothelial cells lining the blood vessels in the metaphyses of the bone. Whereas the VEGFR2 high CD34 low cells uh, were in the blood vessels that were lining away from the metaphyses and in the diaphyses area. And this description seems to match the type L and type H vessels that have been described in the mouse fetal bone marrow. This is a close-up of that appearance. So this is um, the in the diaphyseal N, and this is the kind of like a, the metaphyseal N. And you can see here this VEGFR2 expressing cells uh, with lower expression of CD34 uh, in contrast to the at the tip ECs where they are higher for CD34 and lower for uh, VEGFR2. And you can now begin to look at what are the kind of uh, differences between the environment in the fetal bone marrow and the fetal liver, looking at the adhesion molecules that are involved in uh, hematopoietic stem cells and their progenitor retention, uh, extracellular matrix uh, remodeling, 
uh, molecules and also angiopoietic factors. And this is the kind of expression of the protein uh, that distinguishes bone marrow from the liver uh, and essentially supporting the idea that the fetal bone marrow uh, environment is very different in terms of being able to better retain hematopoietic stem cells and progenitors. What we don't know is how the environment shapes the intrinsic properties of the hematopoietic stem cells. And that's something that you know, we would like to investigate further. So what's the value of the reference map? Um, you can now begin to use this and to understand chromosomal alterations and disease. One good example where we use this was with um, for Down syndrome caused by an extra copy of chromosome 21. Uh, and, and we compared Down syndrome fetal bone marrow from 12 to 13 post-conception weeks uh, when hematopoiesis is active and, and uh, in, in both um, Down syndrome and non-Down syndrome uh, fetal bone marrow to show that there are different cell states that are proportionally increased or contracted comparing Down syndrome with non-Down syndrome. And I'd like to highlight the erythroid lineage here, which is more abundant in Down syndrome and the contraction of megakerocyte and also the B lineage uh, in uh, non-Down syndrome. So using the same uh, concept that we looked for the uh, for the non-Down syndrome fetal bone marrow, we wanted to see what was the prop, prop intrinsic uh, properties of the hematopoietic stem cells in the Down syndrome, and also the extrinsic environment of uh, Down syndrome fetal bone marrow. So if we took uh, hematopoietic stem cells from uh, Down syndrome fetal bone marrow and cultured them on methyl cellulose, you can see the propensity to form erythroid lineage is far greater. So there's an intrinsic bias that leads to greater erythropoiesis in Down syndrome. Um, and also the fetal bone marrow microenvironment is extremely altered in Down syndrome, whereby some of the uh, interactions uh, involving fetal bone marrow and endothelial ligand, uh, the expression of these in Down syndrome and non-Down syndrome is uh, significantly different. Uh, you can see the delta and notch uh, interactions being uh, very skewed in dot Down syndrome and non-Down syndrome as one example. So having an extra copy of chromosome 21 doesn't just result in increased expression of genes of chromosome 21, the transcriptome changes genome-wide and also affects multiple uh, blood and immune lineages. Uh, so this is far more complex than just having you know, more uh, copies of genes on chromosome 21. You can also now look at transcription factor activity, looking at Regulon analysis, comparing Down syndrome and non-Down syndrome in all of the different uh, cell states. And to illustrate this, we looked at the early progenitors as well as the HSC uh, MPP. Uh, there is, um, you know, the regulon that are increased include GAPA, but then decreased in its P1 and P1. These are involved in uh, megakerocyte uh, differentiation as well. Uh, and this increases our knowledge and understanding of how hematopoiesis is altered in, in trisomy 21. Another way of using the reference data, which uh, is currently work in progress, is mapping infant and childhood leukemia. I mentioned earlier on the kind of um, high uh, incidence of B leukemias in childhood, and we can now begin to see whether these B cell leukemias, what type of cells are they most en transcriptionally enriched with, what type of surface protein they may be expressing, and can we leverage the uh, combinatorial expression of surface proteins to design, uh, you, you know, B cell, uh, B cell um, surface protein uh, based biologic therapy uh, against B cell uh, leukemia in childhood. And then, lastly, I kind of want to highlight on how. Uh, one of the uh, examples from our study shows that developmental cell programs uh, are not just uh, something that occurs when we develop, but actually are programs that can be co-opted and re-emerge in, in, you know, in, in disease, in adult onset disease. Uh, here, we're going to look at skin uh, and inflammatory skin disease. And this was work that we published earlier this year. And again, a very much a collaborative effort uh, across many junior researchers and also um, lab leaders. What we did was we took adult healthy skin and performed single cell RNA sequencing. We compared the, you know, the cell states that we identified there with that uh, in embryonic skin uh, between seven to 10 post-conception weeks, and also uh, cells from lesional and non-lesional uh, inflammatory skin disease, two common inflammatory skin diseases, atopic dermatitis and psoriasis. <clears throat> 
what we were very surprised uh, when we looked at um, the cell states was uh, the, um, the the kind of uh, correlation between uh, vascular and epithelial cells in many developmental organs, not just the skin, with one of the three subsets of endothelial cells that we found in adult skin, and this was V3. This is a rare cell state in, in adult skin. And then for the macrophages, we found that it correlated with what we called uh, macrophage 2, uh, which has more of a resident macrophage signature rather than macrophage 1, which has more of a monocyte signature. Um, but what was really surprising when we looked at inflammatory skin disease in atopic dermatitis here and psoriasis, comparing non-lesional and lesional skin, is the relative expansion of these two cell states that had that correlated best with their developmental counterparts, i.e. V3 and also macrophage 2. They were expanded particularly in lesional uh, skin of both atopic dermatitis and psoriasis. Uh, we didn't have many patients, so we looked at bulk RNA sequencing data from a repository data set, which had 38 healthy and around more than 20 atopic dermatitis and psoriasis samples. Uh, and again, we're able to show the V3 and MAC2 signatures in the lesional skin primarily of, of the inflammatory skin disease. Um, when we looked at protein level, we it, it supported our findings in that uh, V3 and MAC2 were expanded in both atopic dermatitis and psoriasis uh, lesional skin. And in fact, in a cohort of patients who were treated with methotrexate for their disease, uh, the, uh, there was a decline in the abundance of V3 and macrophage 2 in, in those patients at a time point that was uh, fitting with the duration of action for methotrexate. So what exactly are V3 and MAC2? So looking at V3 more carefully, they appear to form these dilated capillary venules. And in fact, they express a lot of adhesion molecules and are very similar to high endothelial venules in the lymph node, which are these cells that allow immune cells to actually exit from the circulation to enter the lymph node. And so we wondered whether these cells were involved in kind of leukocyte um, you know, trafficking into the skin and asked what were the gene programs that were conserved between embryonic vascular endothelial cells and uh, skin V3. And we were surprised uh, to see that it was indeed leukocyte recruitment and also angiogenesis that appear to be these gene programs that are conserved, not just for V3, uh, but also MAC2, which led us to ask perhaps these cells are interacting. And one way of analyzing cell-cell interactions, uh, if you have suspension data set, is to probe uh, a database that has receptors and ligands that are known to interact and then actually see the statistically significant predictions for two cells to be interacting. And in our case, uh, V3 and MAC2 were statistically significantly predicted to interact via ACKR1 and CXCR8. Uh, and so we validated that in situ to see if they were indeed um, juxtaposed next to each other. And you can see here the magenta factor 13A cells with the co-stained CD31 and ACKR1 um, vascular endothelial cells uh, next to each other in, in skin. So what we propose is that CXAL8 from macrophage uh, 2 in adult skin interacts with ACKR1, with VE3, uh, and this interaction uh, basically recruits leukocytes uh, and also promotes angiogenesis. And these cells have a counterpart during development which perform the same function, i.e. to seed immune cells into uh, the developing skin. What we don't know is how the pathways are regulated during development and also in inflammatory skin disease, atopic dermatitis and psoriasis, whether it's the same drivers or whether they have different drivers and whether this pathway is relevant in any other skin uh, inflammatory disorders or in fact, any other immune mediated inflammatory disorders. And that's an area that's um, currently being investigated. So I wanted to just show the clinical relevance of these sort of like uh, developmental uh, ATLAS data sets uh, for tissue engineering, uh, the applications of cell therapy, identifying the molecular features that drives a particular differentiation by hematopoietic stem cells so that we can better manipulate uh, stem cell therapy, the relevance to understanding childhood disorders, and also how developmental pathways may be co-opted uh, in adult pathology, providing new uh, uh, areas or avenues for therapeutic um, innovations. So 
one of the important aspects of the ATLAS datasets is that this is very much open reproducible science and the data is available to all, not just as raw data, but the data object for people to use the analysis code available on uh, GitHub or any other repository. And that uh, we were keen to provide the data through web portals so that anyone can access it freely and, and, and benefit from the data as a resource. And also the clinical utility, which I'll come to in a minute. Uh, so uh, all of the data sets for the fetal liver and skin is available to development cell atlas.ncl.ac.uk uh, and you can browse the data set. Uh, here's an example of liver uh, where you can actually see what cells are in the liver based on their transcriptome profile uh, and actually also um, look at the expression of specific genes, in this case CD20 that marks uh, the B lineage. Um, and you can also see the different metadata information. Um, and you can view the data as either heat maps or in this case spot plots for the particular population you're interested in. Uh, and again, you know, simply type in the, the gene that you're interested in as a list or as individual genes, uh, and you can actually uh, be able to interrogate the expression uh, in that. So this is what I mean about the clinical utility. We implemented this for uh, the skin cell atlas data and the fetal bone marrow uh, web portal. So what we, you can do from the web portal is actually have a drop down menu uh, where you can select the type of disorders you're interested in, and then it will link or provide you with a list of genes that are known to be implicated in those disorders. And you can now begin to look at the expression of those genes uh, from the single cell data set that we've generated. And the same is true for the, um, for the fetal bone marrow where we've uh, linked it with genes that are known to be involved in immune, uh, uh, immune deficiencies, inherited immune disorders, uh, and also uh, for childhood leukemias. Uh, the fetal bone marrow web portal is on a slightly different, uh, the, the access is fbm.cellatlas.io, uh, and that's because it's all now uh, cloud-based compared to the original web portal which um, we developed. Um, the next phase is now, you know, we will begin to look at the functional competence of the prenatal immune system. Uh, and one of the kind of more recent studies we've done is to begin to look at how uh, lymphoid tissue develops, uh, in this case, in the gut, uh, uh, in the fetal gut, of how uh, cells come together to essentially begin to form the mesenteric lymph node and, and the tissue um, for the peripheral tissue. Uh, and this is an ongoing work. Um, in, in the group. I'm going to now try to finish very, very briefly with work that we did during the pandemic as a response to it. Uh, and this was very much leveraging the infrastructure that we built to kind of like uh, contribute to the human cell atlas, the framework, the collaborative team science, and the expertise in single cell multiomics. And this was work that we published um, earlier this year. <clears throat> Um, and you can see there are many authors here, but that's to illustrate the, 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 the approach that we've taken in that, you know, to kind of do this very quickly and to do this at scale, lots of people need to work together. Uh, and therefore a more plural form of recognition is probably extremely appropriate and actually, you know, is valuable to everyone. So this was a, a big a collaboration between many organizations, all of whom I've uh, um, shown there, and also all of the um, co-first authors who were involved in various aspects, data generation and data analysis. Uh, and you know, from their experience, it was great because they all enjoyed uh, working collaboratively uh, together and the work was, a, you know, we could proceed with the work very quickly. And this was simply to compare the different, uh, the, the COVID-19 patients of different severity, uh, including asymptomatic healthcare workers, uh, and, and also with um, some uh, controls that were hospital-based and also in healthy uh, volunteers were challenged with intravenous LPS. Altogether, we had a, about 130 patients where we looked at single cell whole transcriptome profiling, TCR, BCR sequencing, and also the surface protein analysis, uh, which these are just the disease category um, um, of how we label the cell, the patients as asymptomatic, mild, moderate, severe, critical. I'm not going to dwell too much on it, but basically this was very much an analysis of the peripheral blood monocytes, uh, peripheral blood uh, mononuclear cells. And what you can do is to use peripheral blood as a window and use the information that you get to understand uh, what is actually happening at the primary site of infection in the lung and using you know, repository lung data 
uh, and to compare how the populations of uh, immune cells in the lung are different to the peripheral blood and also to infer from the progenitor fraction in the peripheral blood, the systemic response uh, of the bone marrow. Uh, and the data is available to, to, to download uh, and also to browse uh, on covid19salatlas.org. Uh, very briefly, this is just to summarize it, the classic finding being there's an unusual myeloid cell, uh, which is a CD16 expressing monocyte, which also expresses a lot of um, uh, receptors and ligands that allows it to interact with platelets. Uh, and in COVID-19 patients appears to be the cell that's also found in the alveolar compartment. Uh, and there's expansion of progenitors, which are dry, being driven down the megakaryocyte differentiation. And then we characterize the different types of T cell responses and the B cell responses. Uh, uh, the kind of highlight that I wanted to say is that in asymptomatic patients, there was preservation of IgA uh, producing B lineage cells, uh, which dramatically declines uh, in symptomatic patients where it's become, where it looks like it's IgG responses. Uh, so all of that is available. And I'm going to finish now to thank my lab uh, for the wonderful years uh, of research, the support at home, uh, and also all of my collaborators. The work is very much a joint production with Sarah Teichman at Cellular Genetics in Sanger, uh, and also a pitch to ask uh, anyone to contact uh, me or my team if you're interested in joining the lab. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'm very happy to take questions now. Thank you, Moz. That was a, an incredible tour. I, I think you just laid out a whole textbook. You just have to write it down now. So covering all of hematopoiesis. Uh, yeah, really an incredible body of work. And thank you uh, very much. I I have I have a few questions, but I'll go to the people who um, you know, entered the, typed up their questions in the QA. And while I'm reading those out, I encourage everyone else also to use the QA button on your Zoom screens to enter your questions. Uh, first one is from Simon Larson. Uh, do events at the fetal stage like infection or injury affect the development of the immune system? That's a great question, Simon. It's something that I'm seriously thinking about and trying to think of ways that we can actually um, understand this. I mean, there's a lot of data, at least in the mouse, that shows that maternal infection and maternal metabolites uh, affect the development of the immune system. How we study that and model that in human will be very interesting uh, and is part of the kind of next phase of our studies in terms of the functional competence. Uh, uh, you know, lots of things to do there. And that's another textbook. <laughs> I'm sure you have a lot on your, in your list. <laughs> so, uh, uh, this next question is from Ram Das Gupta. Brilliant work and talk as usual. I was wondering if you could speculate on the genesis of autoimmune disease based on differences in B-cell subpopulations in fetal bone marrow versus adult bone marrow? Firstly, thanks, Ram. Uh, it's a great question. One that I haven't actually thought about, I have to admit, and I can kind of like speculate, but it would be quite a wild speculation. You almost wonder because of the, um, because of the kind of like relative abundance of the different types that autoimmunity may actually be uh, more of a postnatal kind of like driven disease or postnatal onset disease rather than prenatal onset. But that's a very wild speculation because I think you, you need that plasma cells to sort of like be formed, uh, which can then, well, at least in the case of the, the autoimmunity, which results from uh, autoantibodies. Uh, so for that, but for the T cell based autoimmunity, I think the the kind of like the verdict would be very open whether this is something that happens as a result of you know poor selection during thymocyte generation and therefore it remains there lying kind of like dormant and then a trigger occurs in postnatal life. So lots there, but they're just my my personal speculation and I you know may not be substantiated. <laughs> Can I add one uh, aspect to that, which is maybe different autoimmune 
diseases may even be different, right? Are they systemic? Are they tissue specific? And then there are supposedly tissue specific autoimmune diseases that have a systemic component because you know these they're comorbid with other tissue specific autoimmune diseases, right? Yeah, I mean, I think even if I'm not sure how many autoimmune diseases that are completely one tissue focused, if you see what I mean, there will be several tissues that are involved. And it is possible that it's actually systemic, but the symptoms are not sufficiently of a higher above a certain threshold for it to actually, you know, be picked up or even manifest as disease specifically for that particular organ. But you would think based on you know, the immunological basis of the disease that this is not going to be extremely tissue specific, but involves several tissues and has a more kind of like a systemic basis to it, but it's just the level of the symptoms and signs. I, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I was thinking I had in mind type one diabetes, which is supposed to be tissue specific and in the pancreas, but type one diabetes is comorbid with other tissue specific autoimmune diseases. Then rheumatoid arthritis, at least I, it's not published. I heard that you know, th th there's this belief that it's not systemic, or at least you can't see it in the blood, uh, in peripheral blood. Uh, but you know, I, I don't know if anyone has ever done a system, systematic analysis of that. Uh, and I, I think it would be very intriguing based on your results, or based on your work to say, what are the differences, say psoriasis that you looked at, uh, other inflammatory and immune conditions? What, did, what do you see in the blood versus what you see in the tissue? Yeah, no, I think that's a good question because a lot of people have, you know, in the past historically studied blood because it's the most accessible and now more, more people are studying tissue. But coming to your point with rheumatoid arthritis, you do get a lot of other organ involvement. You know, you can get rheumatoid nodules in the skin, uh, inflammation uh, in the lung and the kidney, etc. Uh, so, you know, most of these kind of like what has been thought to be uh, extremely, you know, one tissue or you know limited tissue specificity has has a lot of um, systemic. Um, you know, a basis to it. I mean, psoriasis certainly affects joints. You can get psoriatic arth arthropathy. So if you actually dig deeper, the, the, the diseases are not um, what they seem to be. Makes a lot of sense. Uh, one more question from uh, Ram. Uh, also wondering if you looked at regulatory interactions between bone marrow endothelial cells and HSCs versus fetal level endothelial cells and HSCs. Yes, we did. I think it's in the manuscript, um, which I didn't go into, uh, which is kind of quite interesting. Uh, but it was more focused on the sinusoidal type endothelial cells in both bone marrow and fetal liver. Thank you. We have one more question but Ram, oh, from Ram, but Ram, sorry, I'm going to jump to the other questioners and then come back to you. Uh, from an anonymous attendee, Thanks for the wonderful lecture. Are you going to do more on uh, spatiotemporal transcriptome technologies? Yeah, uh, again, great question. We are generating the data for the organs that we've studied um, using spatial genomics methods, um, both visium and in situ sequencing uh, at the moment. So that's going to be uh, another complementary uh, data set to put into context what we've already discovered. Any quick comments on uh, your preferred spatial omics technology? Um, so far, we've used um, Visium, uh, and then we have used in situ sequencing. Uh, you know, that's that's what the, the two that we've um, kind of like uh, done most with. There's multiplex RNA scopes that is fairly limited compared to in situ sequencing. I see. And uh, for in situ sequencing, what was the technology? Um, so basically, it's using the uh, Mats Nielsen method, the kind of like a cyclic probe thing. Okay, fantastic. Uh, Swain Chen, fetal versus adult hematopoiesis, been a big conceptual difference in development. So how similar are the progenitors that you're seeing in fetal versus adult? Uh, so basically, the question is, are they completely different cell types, fundamentally, developmentally? And can we see that in uh, gene expression? Uh, 
Yeah, um, great question. We have looked at this. Um, you see very sort of like, you know, they have the transcriptome profile of what we would call a hematopoietic stem cells, but there are uh, differences. Uh, and one of the things that I kind of keep talking about is how do we kind of like define what are these differences that, you know, contribute to the elixir of youth uh, of the hematopoietic stem cells, particularly in the liver, which seem to be, you know, proliferating or have a higher capacity to proliferate compared to fe even fetal bone marrow and uh, adult bone marrow. Um, we've, we showed that in the fetal liver manuscript, some of the key transcriptional differences, but I think uh, what we have not done is to actually link the transcriptional differences to their functional attributes, and that's something that we're trying to do. So I, I think, you know, wouldn't be surprised if you saw differences, and it's a subjective question, but how, how big are the differences, and would you consider it like a different ontology altogether? No. No, no. I mean, I think that there are more similarities than differences. Having said that, much of what we've done for that has been primarily RNA. So, you know, I think the added layers of information from uh, the open chromatin and other sort of, uh, uh, or, you know, parameters that we haven't measured, I think will be quite important in telling us how the intrinsic properties are wired differently between the cell types across lifespan. Got it. Okay, coming back to you, Ram. Um, exciting to see the similarity between oncofetal reprogramming and cancer, which incidentally Ram has uh, been studying in liver cancer, uh, and emergence of fetal programs in inflammatory skin disease. So wondering how these endothelial cells, macrophages, remodel the T cell phenotypes in the microenvironment. Yeah, no, I think that's a great question. And I was a big fan of your paper, uh, Ram, when it was published, uh, because it sort of like had very similar macrophage vascular endothelial cell interactions. And we did compare the data set and they were very similar to the, you know, expression profile of what we describe as MAC2 and V3. Uh, we were trying to look at it for uh, squamous cell carcinoma, but we haven't really got um, like a good, um, single cell data set that we could use um, because I thought I wanted to look at the earlier stage and the Paul Cavari data that was published is actually of SCCs at a much later stage. Uh, and that's something that will be worth pursuing, um, but not something we're actively doing at the moment, just because of bandwidth more than anything else. Okay, great to see the connections. Uh, okay, well, well, if there's no more questions in the Q&A, then it's my turn. No. Uh, okay, so uh, as a non-hematopoiesis, non -expert in hematopoiesis, I mean, if I Google or look at textbooks, every single figure I see about the hematopoietic lineage hierarchy is different. I, and it's 2021, why, why can't people agree on that? Um, I guess it's sort of like a bit like um, people still disagree on what cells what cells are called, what the what are yeah, the kind of yeah. like markers. I mean, there's a lot of history that goes uh, with this, and I think you know this will be a very gradual process uh, because it has always been defined by a select group of canonical markers, surface markers, uh, and that has been the textbook for such a long time. And to sort of like step back and actually question whether these canonical markers are the way forwards, or whether we should have a more uh, a more uh, abstract approach, if you want to call it that, like less prescriptive based on these surface markers. I think the scientific community has to come to that. And also, perhaps if you actually extrapolate further, and I'm being slightly philosophical here, whether the cell is actually the denominator, and whether this should be about programs that cells are actively undertaking. And that can be quite variable across time. So there's quite a lot of uh, steps for us to go um, and quite a lot of engagement and you know movement needed um, across all members of the community. I, I, I'm glad you brought up programs actually. I remember 
Peter Karchenko's algorithm, whose name I forget, Pagoda, long ago, uh, which tried to just project cells onto specific gene expression programs uh, from, you know, curated databases uh, and, and essentially described them as bags of programs, right? Or yeah. dashboards with, you know, red or green lights for different programs. Uh, and, and I think that idea is now gaining more and more acceptance. Uh, but, but it's still, I mean, whether you think of a cell as living in program space or, you know, individual gene space, they're still abstract spaces and you can put, put, designate, you know, or represent each cell as a dot in that space. And then you can cluster in that space. Yeah. Uh, and, and then do you think that sing, at least the single cell views of hematopoiesis are converging on something that the field agrees on? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of the kind of like a nearest neighbor type method is much better than sort of having cells as like unique um, boundaries, you know, cell types as the unique boundaries. So I think that's a good space to sort of like pursue this. But coming back to the gene programs, I think one of the problems we have is that a lot of the annotation for the gene programs are not robust. And there needs to be a, an overhaul of that to make this more meaningful because, you know, we can do this now, we have the ability to do it, but it's not going to be as meaningful as you first, you know, revise how you annotate gene programs. Absolutely. The challenge in gene programs is everyone has their own definition of the gene program. And because we simply don't know enough, that, that actually makes the problem harder in some sense. Exactly. Because we know what, where the genes are, more or less. We don't know the programs so well. Yeah. Uh, uh, maybe one, one or two more questions we have time for. Sure. Uh, so, so GWAS, right? So now, oh, okay, I, actually I'll back up a bit. So you've, showed, uh, you've shown some really impressive connections between fetal liver and thymus and the UMAPs and showing, you know, developmental uh, processes and hierarchies. And I guess they're from many different data sets, right? You have this, uh, had this amazing run of publications this year. Uh, and, is it, and ultimately the Human Cell Atlas, I guess, wants to stitch all of these together. Yeah. Into one single, you know, mother of all UMAPs and uh, for, you know, say hematopoiesis, uh, in all these organs over all time. Uh, is that, you know, how far are we uh, from that situation? It's a good question because something that I've discussed or we've talked about with John Marioni, whether, you know, should it be like uh, one representative or an aggregate? Um, and I think this has been a, 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 an ongoing discussion, you know, which, you know, Sham, you've contributed to as well. Um, the data sets are there. And I think one of the kind of like advantages is the ability to sort of like, um, you know, integrate or combine the data sets together. Not necessarily, I, I use the word integrate quite cautiously because it doesn't mean that you have to sort of like make them the same, but you can actually, you know, put them together at least. Um, and, and, and that is possible. But one of the things specifically from the perspective of development, I think, having or the work that we're doing, looking at a whole embryo atlas from a very early embryo uh, would enable us to sort of like have the framework to then uh, bring together the information from the different organs. Uh, and that is how I see the version one of the developmental cell atlas. And then as the kind of like numbers of whole embryos uh, increase, then this can be the prototype, but there's quite a lot of computational uh, development and you know, the sheer scale of the data, is, it becomes almost like an engineering feat uh, rather than necessarily a kind of like an intellectual feat, if you see what I mean. Absolutely, the engineering aspect of the field is, is growing. It's, it's yeah. not merely about the idea uh, in, in some sense, at least on the data analysis side. That's in a very nice point. We're officially out of time, but I'm going to sneak in one more question if you're up for sure. it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 
Um, so many algorithms for inferring signaling uh, from uh, single cell data and increasingly from spatial data. And you showed some beautiful results actually from that, from that kind of analysis. Uh, but often when you do this, at least in our experience, is you just get an explosion of signaling predictions. You just get a hairball. And ranking those, the hairs in that hairball is not straightforward because you know the p-values you get or the scores you get for each edge in the network, they're not that meaningful. Uh, so how, what, how does one proceed? You know, it's not like a list of D genes where you can say, take the best fold change, best p-value. Okay, let's study that first, right? But when you have this hairball and you can't even differentiate which is the strongest or most important signaling interaction, where do, where do you start? Like, how did you pull out the interesting ones? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And in fact, it's one that my lab members keep coming and saying, this is a massive amount of like data, where do we begin? Uh, so some things we do, uh, or and there are also some algorithms that allow you to do that, whether those programs are actually active. So you can look at the downstream uh, expression of genes that are involved from the receptor ligand interactions. Again, that depends on how well that's been annotated. Secondly, there's quite a lot of manual sleuthing literature <laughs> reading around uh, and shortlisting of you know what people have described and is known and therefore you can actually leverage that historical knowledge uh, legacy knowledge to actually support you know what you see and whether it's meaningful so you're right in that there isn't actually a quick fix um, solution at the moment but if you then combine this with like spatial information and that you can actually have a second layer of where the p-value takes into account of like spatial location in the tissue, which, you know, whittles down the number of interactions that you can. So I think there are several iterations. This reminds me of the problem of how we used to do annotation before there are more of these kind of like uh, uh, training data sets that you can then, you know, have a broad classification of cells, and then you can have more manual sort of like um, annotation to refine it. So I think we are not quite at that stage where there are a lot of training data sets that we can use to then whittle down the number of statistically significant p-values that you then have to um, deal with. Very true. It's early days for that field. And yeah, I guess one has to use many different filters and literature is a big part of that. Uh, I, I could go on asking questions, but uh, you know, thank you so much. It's been no problems. very, uh, very exciting to hear about all the latest yeah. news from your lab. And thank hope you. to have you back at some point. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it would be great to sort of like, I haven't visited my mom and family for more than two years now. So there you go. Thanks so very much for hosting me and um, good to see everyone. Thank you, Mars. Thank you all Bye. for joining. Bye-bye.